Good morning. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to start by asking you to think about what you know already about civil rights and where you learned it from. So in your head for a few seconds, just think about what do you know about civil rights and where you learned it from. If you only remember one thing from our lecture today, try to remember this. The stories that we tell about history matter for how we understand the present. In this particular case, the stories we tell about civil rights history matter for how we understand the present with regards to race and issues of social justice. And that's why we assigned Malcolm X this week. Right? Because we think Malcolm X complicates what you already know about civil rights. Right? So everyone should know something about civil rights already. Right? But Malcolm X might complicate or challenge what you already know about civil rights. Right? So I want to start my introduction by giving you a sense of what the most popular version of civil rights history is, what we'll call the, the narrow version or the short version of civil rights. This should be a familiar image to most of you. Um, so the most famous event associated with the civil rights movement is the March on Washington. The most famous person associated with the civil rights movement is Martin Luther King. Right? And I want to start with a portion of his I Have a Dream speech, which I think you'll be familiar with. So a quick show of hands, who's familiar with that speech in some context? Right? Everybody is, right? That's what I mean by everybody knows about civil rights. You couldn't not know about this. Okay? My concern is that if we just fixate on moments like this, we think of a, a short civil rights history. So Rosa Parks refuses to go proceed on a bus in 1955. We have the March on Washington in 63, Civil Rights Act is signed in 64, and that effectively ends racism in the United States. Right? That would be a short or narrow view of civil rights history. And it might also focus too much on prominent national leaders like Martin Luther King. Right? It takes nothing away from King right, to say it's a great speech, but this is not the entirety of civil rights history. Particularly reflecting on our discussions of Plessy last week, the language of colorblindness that shows up at the end here, judged by uh, content of character rather than the color of your skin. Right? That's one of the things people will talk about with regards to colorblindness, a justification for colorblindness. I have a particular concern that if we just focus on that element of the speech, we're going to lose even a sense of what the, the March on Washington was about. Right? This is only a two-minute clip, but it's the most famous two minutes of the Civil Rights Movement. So the questions we would want to ask would be, what was this march about, first of all, and then what are the broader histories and disputes that exist within the civil rights movement? Okay. One place we could look would be just the very title of the march itself. Right? So it was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Right? It wasn't the March on Washington for King's Dream. Right? It was the March on Washington very explicitly for Jobs and Freedom. You could also look at what kind of signs people are carrying at the march, right? Focusing on issues like housing, right? jobs, other signs focused on issues like education, equal pay. Right? So more issues than we see in just that short two-minute clip. Right? I'd also call your attention to the fact that this is primarily women who are marching here. Right? If we focus just on King, we can lose sight of the fact that the civil rights movement 
at the foundation was made up of grassroots women who organized and fought for civil rights. It wasn't just national leaders like Martin Luther King or like Malcolm X. You might also be surprised to know that the I Have a Dream part is at the end of King's speech, and it's only two minutes after 12 minutes that precede it, right? So it's only a small portion of the speech itself. We can also look at some of the language that precedes it in the speech. Right? I won't read through all of this, but he starts by echoing the symbolic shadow in which we stand today. You saw Lincoln there. He says the Negro, Negro is still not free. Right? He's an exile in his own land. This is a shameful condition. And then I highlight the last part, because I think this is a, a phrase that Malcolm X would have, would have enjoyed. Right? America has given Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Right? So even if we just took it as the speech itself, the language of colorblindness that emerges at the end of the speech isn't what the actual speech was about. Right? It certainly wasn't what the whole march was about, and it wasn't what the whole civil rights movement was about. It also obscures the fact that King's focus in the last years of his life was on poverty and against the Vietnam War, right? both positions that made him largely unpopular nationally. Right? So he wasn't the sanctified hero that we now remember him as. Right? We might ask, why does this matter for us now? Right? Is this just a, a historical dispute about how we understand civil rights? And I want to argue that it's not. Right? So the way in which we understand moments like March on Washington in the broader context of civil rights matters a great deal for how we understand the present. This is data that was released just last week on poverty. Um, I imagine it's not probably a surprise to most of you. The specific numbers might be a surprise, but the gradations are probably not a surprise. Right? If we assume that, dream, that King's dream came true with the March on Washington, right? if we assume that racism ended there or it ended with the Civil Rights Act, we only have one way to explain a chart like this. Right? It would be to say that poor people are to blame for their own poverty. Right? A counter to that would be to try to understand the ways in which inequality has been structured historically and how it influences people's life chances right, and access to resources. Right? So it matters a great deal how we understand that history. A closely aligned chart would be incarceration rates by race and gender. Right? The rate, way to read this is 4.8% of black men are incarcerated. Uh, the way they calculate the statistic actually includes men under the, boys under the age of 18, right? So if it was just people over the age of 18, it's actually closer to 10% uh, for African-American men. Right? Again, not a surprise, right? But we have nominally race-neutral, colorblind, legal law enforcement policies that have disproportionate effects on communities of color, right? We need a historical understanding to be able to make sense of how numbers like this emerge, okay? You can see the flip side of both those two charts would be one like this. Median net worth by household. Right? Again, the numbers might be a surprise, but the range of them, I guess, is not. Uh, median is the, the middle point, right? So half populations above, half population is below. Uh, it's a better measure than mean because it's not distorted by a few very wealthy individuals. Yeah. Again, if we have no understanding of how the federal government has directed resources towards some communities and away from other communities, the only explanation for this is. Some folks have really succeeded well by their own merits. Other folks have failed by their own merits. Right? I don't want to underplay the importance of hard work, individual responsibility. Right? But quite simply, individual responsibility and hard work do not account for this. Right? It's historically inaccurate to make that claim. And I'll talk about the ways that's true later in my talk. So that's why I say we need a deeper understanding of the history and legacy of the civil rights movement, what it was able to achieve, what it was trying to achieve, but then also who fought back against it and why it didn't achieve all the things it was going to achieve. Right? We need a set of stories to tell ourselves about the past in order to not be upset about the slides we've just seen. Right? We need to be able to make sense of them in some way. One of the ways we make sense of them is assume racism ended neatly in the 60s, therefore poverty and wealth is just a fair contest. Okay? I want to argue against that. And that's why I started with the song by Nina Simone. Uh, the lyrics to it are on the handout you have for today. The song's called Mississippi Goddamn. She wrote it about two tragic events that happened in 1963. The first is the assassination of civil rights leader Megger Evers, who was shot in his own driveway. The second is the bombing of a church in Birmingham, Alabama that killed four young girls. Uh, in both cases, the perpetrators of the crimes weren't, um, weren't convicted until years later, uh, the 70s and the 90s in the case of 
Birmingham, Alabama, and not until the 90s in the case of Megar Evers, right? So when we think about conditions of impunity, these were crimes in which people acted with impunity to murder African Americans. Right? My interest in Nina Simone is when she says everybody knows about Mississippi, but then adds the goddamn, right? So everybody knows about these things, but why isn't anyone doing anything about it? Right? So if you arrive at this time, it would be impossible not to know about these events. Okay? There were, in the major news coverage, right? So Highly in Life magazine, uh, if you saw the movie The Help, that shows up there. Um, Time magazine, talking about the Birmingham School uh, church bombing, right? So everybody knew about these events, yet why weren't resources marshaled to find the killers, right? This is Simone's concern. Right? What she said about why she wrote the song is this, and she described it as her first civil rights song. So I was sitting there in my den when news came over the radio that somebody had thrown dynamite into the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, while four black children were attending Bible, Sunday class, Bible study class. Four of them had been killed. It was more than I could take, and I sat struck dumb in my den, like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. All the truths that I had denied to myself for so long rose up and slapped my face. The bombing of the little girls in Alabama and the murder of Meg Evers were like the final pieces of a jigsaw that made no sense until you had fitted the whole thing together. I suddenly realized what it was to be black in America in 1963. So I want to argue that Simone's song, Mississippi Goddamn, can provide us a useful lens through which to view history. Right? Let me explain what I mean by that. Right? She's saying it's not enough to just be aware of incidents that happen. Right? Not enough to just be aware of the history of the civil rights movement. But we need to have a deeper understanding of it. Right? We need to have a deeper understanding of the context in which these things happened and how these pieces fit together. I think the jigsaw metaphor is, is useful here. Right? So we can't just be aware that these bad incidents happen, but why did they happen? How did they impact American history? How might they impact our present? Right? That's why I want to start with Mississippi Goddamn. Right? So everybody knows about civil rights, but does everybody really understand what civil rights was about? The body of my talk is divided into two sections. Uh, the first section is going to be talking about the different themes that influenced Malcolm X for the speech you read for today. So I won't say a lot about the speech itself, but I want to draw your attention to a number of the different threads that come together, right, that he was drawing on, that he weaves together, right? So he's not the first person to have a lot of the ideas that he expresses, but he expresses them in a very powerful form. The second part of my talk will focus on the conflicting notions of rights, right? So how human rights claims were motivated in favor of civil rights, but also against civil rights. But first, what is the history of Malcolm X's present? How did he come to give the speech he gave in 1964? Inescapably, the place we have to start is with slavery. What I ask you to focus on here is the, the magnitude of slavery. Right? The infrastructure it would have taken the ships, right, the people involved, to transport human beings from parts of the world, Africa, to other parts of the world, right? It's a massive, wide-scale, long-term project, right, that required huge amounts of infrastructure. Okay. The other thing I would call your attention to, and what Malcolm X, I think, calls our attention to, is the ways in which some nations profited by the buying and selling of human beings, right? Portugal, France, Great Britain, the colonies that became the United States, the Dutch. Right? This was about money. Right? This is about money and free labor. This is why countries engaged in the slave trade. Right? This had legacies in terms of which countries became wealthy countries and which countries did not. There's no nice way to put this. Uh, slavery was about buying and selling human beings and about the degradation of those human beings. Right? You can't sugarcoat that. What you might not immediately think about is this isn't just a textbook history, right? but for Malcolm X's audience in Cleveland, great-grandparents right, would have had stories about slavery. Right? This is in no way an abstract concept. Right? This is part of people's family trees. Right? That's going to shape their response to the speech. Right? That's one of the threads he's drawing on. This isn't just a, an abstract reference to hundreds of years of free labor given, right? free labor given in, in servitude, right? forcefully given, is reference to where were your great-grandparents. Right? It's that direct of a reference. It's a family tree reference. But there are reasons for hope. Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments that, in theory, 
were meant to guarantee voting rights, citizenship, and outlaw slavery. Right? That was a moment of hope, a brief period of hope for African Americans that they were going to be able to exercise their rights as American citizens. Right? An editorial cartoon, I think, emphasizes this from Harper's Weekly in 1867, uh, African Americans lining up to vote. And I call your attention to the third gentleman who's wearing a military uniform. Right? So he'd fought, the person who's being represented is meant to have fought for the North in the Civil War, is now exercising his democratic rights to vote. Right? Um, I should note that, of course, women of either race can't vote at this point. Right? But the importance here is that there is a history of the importance of voting rights for African Americans. But again, that moment of hope is extremely short-lived, right? Groups first like the KKK, but then other uh, similar types of white supremacist organized mob violence work to use physical violence to threaten African Americans, in some cases kill African Americans and white supporters, to not exercise these rights that they are supposedly granted on paper, right? So echoes of, of Nussbaum right here. The amendments exist, right? These things are meant to be in place, but in practice, they're not in place. And groups like the KKK are the reason they're not in place. Right. From the late 1860s through the better part of the 20th century, uh, groups like this used lynching, right, mobbed violence and killings, to threaten and intimidate African Americans. Right. The main problem for African Americans was no one was coming to their aid to stop this. Right. The legal authorities were often members of the KKK. Right? And no amendments could be passed through the Senate because they refused to vote on anti lynching legislation. Right? So to whom does one appeal when the powers that are supposed to address issues like murder aren't doing it? A right? um, note that I actually wasn't familiar with until I did a little bit more research here. Um, the Senate finally in 2005 apologized for their refusal to act. Right? So, Malcolm X's very pointed critiques of the government right, are founded deeply in African American history. Right? This isn't isolated white racists who are doing these things. That would be bad enough. It's isolated white racists, I'm sorry, it's large scale efforts by white racists who are also members of law enforcement, also member of powerful political groups. Right? That's those groups acting with impunity. Right? There's no one who's going to address these issues. It's in this context that we need to understand Malcolm X's appeals to self-defense, right? So the language of we need to form rifle clubs might sound alarming, right? But there's a deep precedent for it. I just want to highlight two people. Uh, I.D.B. Wells Barnett uh, said a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. It should be used for the protection which the law refuses to give, right? So the particular language, the law refuses to help us, so we have to help ourselves. We have to protect ourselves. Um, I also should note that uh, I.D.B. Wells Barnett was one of the first people to emphasize the sexualization of violence in the South. So the ways in which rapes of black women and lynchings of black men were part of a, a plan to, to threaten physically, right, to, to take the body as a site in which one's going to ex express their violence. Okay. We could also look to W.B. Du Bois. Um, says, today we raise a terrible weapon of self-defense. When the murderer comes, he shall no longer strike us in the back. When the armed winters gather, we too must gather armed. When the mob moves, we propose to meet it with bricks and clubs and guns. Right? So Malcolm X isn't the first African American to advocate self-defense. Right? There's a precedent for it, and the, the specific precedent is when the law refuses to aid you. Right? Citizens are supposed to have a relationship with their government, with their law enforcement, to aid them when people want to harm your property, right? or harm your person. If that doesn't exist, then self-defense. So that's one of the major traditions on which Malcolm X is drawing. Another is black labor organizing. Uh, and here I'm just highlighting A. Philip Randolph. Um, he was the head of the union of uh, sleeping car porters. So he organized railroad workers. Um, he organized what was going to be the first march on Washington. So this march never actually took place, but it was a threatened march that was trying to get President Roosevelt to um, pass fair employment practices legislation. So there was still deep structural racism during the World War II era. Um, the armed forces were segregated and segregated down to the point where they gave white soldiers and black soldiers white blood and black blood. Right? On the home front, African Americans couldn't participate and get many of the good jobs that existed with the war boom. Right? And that's what they were 
we're lobbying for. Some of the specific language here um, says to mobilize five million Negroes into a militant math, mass for pressure. Right? So Randolph was extremely skeptical about the idea that whites could participate in civil rights organizing like this. Um, he said, you can take whites' money, but if you take their money, then they have your movement. Right? He thought it was important for blacks to organize among themselves to have more control and self-determination over the organizing that they were doing. Right? I'd also point out here the number of Negroes assembled in New York City. Right? Next week, we're going to be reading uh, a novella by, um, by Larson, uh, Quicksand, that takes place, at least in part, in Harlem. Right? So it's important that Malcolm X is exposed to these ideas while he's in Harlem. Right? So thinking about a place like Harlem as a, as a black metropolis that was a, a seabed of cultural and political energy for the black community. The context of World War II is again important, I think, even for the direct language that Malcolm X uses with the ballot and the bullet, um, because there were a number of important um, movements to, to try to leverage World War II to increase African American rights in the US. Right? So the most famous is the Double V campaign. Um, double victory meant victory over fascism abroad, fascism and Nazism abroad, and victory over racism at home. Right? You can think of it as a, a politics of shame campaign. Right? How can the US claim to be the leader of the free world in fighting prejudice abroad when it's discriminating against its own citizens in the United States? The march that's pictured here is from Philadelphia in 1944. These are folks marching to try to get jobs as trolley operators. Right? That might seem like a really random thing to march for, but these were important uh, working class, middle class jobs. Right? And African Americans were blocked from them right? because Fair Employment Practices Act wasn't being put into place there. I call your attention to the specific sign that's here. It says, we drive tanks, why not trolleys? Right? So we're fighting bravely abroad in World War II, but yet we can't drive a trolley back in Philadelphia. Right? To the best of my knowledge, this, is, this era is where Malcolm X draws the language for the ballot or the bullet. Right? Other protesters at the time were saying things like, we're very able to shoot and to stop bullets abroad. We should have the same access to the ballot at home. So again, this is an important context that Malcolm X is drawing on. The last in this section of sort of the threads that influence Malcolm X would be anti-colonialism. Right? So a number of nations, many of which are pictured here, uh, gained their independence in the years after World War II. And these are deeply influential for Malcolm X, particularly this conference that took place in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. Right? Here's what he had to say about it. It says, once you study what happened at the Bandung Conference, it actually serves as a model for the same procedure you and I can use to get our problems solved. At Bandung, all the nations came together, the darker nations from Africa and Asia. He talks about the differences among these groups. He says, despite their economic and political differences, they came together. Right? Now that language, the darker races of Asia and Africa, sounds odd to our ear now. Right? But his appeal was, his thought was, these nations, these recently independent nations, have a common experience, right? a common historical experience with white supremacy, and they want to be able to choose their own path. Right? So this is sometimes called the Third World Conference. Right? And Third World originally didn't mean sort of conditions of poverty, as it means sort of in, co in common usage today. It meant nations that wanted to choose their own path. Right? They didn't want to align with a first world power, the United States, and capitalism, nor did they want to align with the second world, Soviet Union and communism. They wanted the right to choose their own alliances and which path they would follow. Okay. Well, Malcolm X says we need to internationalize the civil rights movement. We need to start looking for some new allies, take a new spin on this civil rights thing. This is what he's talking about. Right? These aren't empty appeals to maybe these nations would be interested in joining us. These are a number of nations are coming to independence right now. Their conditions seem to resemble the conditions of African Americans and people of color in the United States. Maybe we can use that as a way to push in a new direction. Okay. So the importance of that first section is to try to emphasize to you that Malcolm X was a deep student of history. Right? He often said he got his PhD while he was in prison, um, which I think is a, is a funny line. Right? But he, he cared deeply about history. Right? So he's not the first person to make many of the arguments that you read about in The Ballad or the Bullet. Right? But he does a, an excellent job of weaving them together. Right? So there's deep historical precedence for almost everything that shows up 
in Malcolm X's speech. Right? He's, he's weaving these, these different threads together. The second part of the body of my lecture this morning is I want to talk about the differences between ideas of rights. Okay? So Malcolm X quite forcefully argues for human rights or an internationalized version of civil rights. But a lot of people argued against civil rights also using the language of rights. Right? And again, my concern is these folks often aren't mentioned in our discussions of civil rights. Right? So if we focus only on sort of the positive outcomes of the civil rights movement, we can lose sight of the fact that a whole lot of people opposed it. Okay. One set of the people who opposed it were what were called the Dixiecrats. Um, the definition for that is on your, on your handout. And Malcolm X makes reference to these these folks uh, in his speech. These were Southern senators who initially broke away from the Democratic Party, or they were a wing of the Democratic Party, right, and eventually shifted over to the Republican Party. Their argument against civil rights was, this is an infringement on states' rights. So if states want to segregate their citizens, that's the prerogative of that state. Right? The federal government should not interfere in that regard. This is part of civil rights history, but it's not one that we usually talk about. Right? When he talks about Dixiecrats filibustering, these were the folks who were vehemently opposed to civil rights legislation. Right? They thought it was an awful thing for the United States. Now, it would be one thing if you could say that these folks left political power with the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 64, but they didn't. Right? Strom Thurmond on the left remained in the Senate until 2002. And I'd say many of the arguments that they were outlining, the ideologies that underlay the Dixie Crowder Party, have become more prominent in our political discourse than they have been historically. Right? We need to understand that in order to understand the civil rights movement. Right? So using rights to fight back against civil rights. Right? One of the most important cases in which the Dixiecrats were disenfranchising populations was in Mississippi. Right? So they were blocking African Americans from exercising the right to vote through a host of means. Uh, in some cases, violence, through poll taxes, through literary te literacy tests, right? and just through threats that bad things would happen to you were you to try to exercise your right to vote. Uh, Ella Baker is the most famous civil rights activist who I think you pr probably have never heard of. Okay. She was extremely influential at the grassroots level in organizing sort of the infrastructure for, for protests. Right, so she deeply believed that it wasn't about having figurehead leaders. It was about getting everyday people to recognize their power to change their lives and to change history. Right? One of her quotes that goes along with this, she said, oppressed people, whatever their level of formal education, have the ability to understand and interpret the world around them, to see the world for what it is, and to move to transform it. Okay? We could think here of Professor uh, San Juan Pastor's lecture and the idea of standpoint theory. Right? So this is exactly what standpoint theory says. You don't need to have a particular set of credentials in order to understand, interpret, and act in the world. Right? You just need to have an understanding of your surroundings, right? a deep understanding that can often come from being grounded in a particular place. I want to talk about one of the people who Ella Baker um, mentored, Fannie Lou Hamer. Right? So the context here is Mississippi uh, is still controlled by the Democratic Party, but these are segregationist Democrats, right? And so the people who they're sending to Washington to vote are disenfranchising their African American population, right? They're voting against civil rights, even though Mississippi has a, a huge African American population who's in favor of civil rights. The Mississippi um, Freedom Party goes to the Democratic National Convention to challenge this, right? In this case, both L. Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer are pushing against Martin Luther King, who's urging them to take a um, take a deal, right, to only have a couple representatives from the Mississippi Freedom Party show up, they want more. They want more representation. The speech I want to play is Fannie Lou Hamer testifying before that credentials committee about what happened to her when she and her peers tried to organize to vote. 
me pause for one second. Um, just the volume is important for a speech. All right, so what I want you to think about there, what are the violations to which Hammer is testifying? All right, Hammer is testifying. What's the problem that she's identifying? Think about that for a second. These are other incidents of racial violence in just one county of Mississippi in the same year that Hammer's testifying. Right? This is just the first half of the year, January through July. Beatings of people, crosses burned in yards, firebombs thrown, shots fired. This is the second half of the year, August to November. Now, what are the violations that are taking place here? If we just think of it as isolated incidents of violence against African Americans, we're missing the point. The violations to which Hamer was testifying were that we tried to vote to exercise political power, and then we were beaten, then we were shot at, then we were threatened. Right? It's a point about the inseparability of rights that we've seen both in Nussbaum and in Fergoso. Right? If you can't exercise your right to vote, right, then you can't elect officials who are going to help protect you. Right? Then you don't have protection over your body, right? you don't have educational rights, you don't have economic rights, you don't have rights to hold property because anyone can come and drive you out of it. Right? These are the things that people were arguing against with the Dixiecrats. Right? This is why segregation in the South was a problem. It's why African Americans wanted the right to vote in places like Mississippi. And again, it's in this context I think we need to understand Malcolm X's speech. Right? So I want to play 
a clip of him talking at Oxford University in a debate in 1964, which ends with the phrase, by any means necessary. It's the most famous line that goes along with Malcolm X. Right? And I highlight a poster here and a, uh, a little tank top on the right. right? So it becomes a, a bumper sticker, right? it becomes a slogan right? that's associated with Malcolm X. But I think it matters a great deal that we understand his argument about rights in order to understand why he's saying African Americans can resort to any means necessary. Right? We can't just focus on the bumper sticker. We need to understand how does he get there. Right? So check this out. If you keep just the last 20 seconds in mind when we read Hobbes in a couple weeks, that's really the Cliff Notes version of Hobbes, right? If the social contract is violated, then violence is all right, right? 
it's the natural instinct that people are going to resort to if the government is not fulfilling their end of the social contract. What's important here, and why I think it's important to have the context for by any means necessary, right? it's a very specific articulation of what structural racism looks like. Right? So it isn't just white racist attitudes, it's racialist senators, saying racialist, it's white supremacist senators, having disproportionate influence in politics such that they can block civil rights legislation that would actually fulfill the rights of African Americans. Right? So there's structures of power that are disenfranchising African Americans, not just attitudes. That is what the racism he's pointing to, and that's what for him justifies by any means necessary. So I think that's an important critique or challenge for us to have about civil rights, is that it's too easy to take the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 as being the end of racism in the United States, that the civil rights movement achieved its goals. Right? This was a, a very important moment, right? but it did not solve racism in the United States. It's one of the things that Malcolm X is so suspicious about in his speech, how it's been chopped up to such an extent that it's not going to be enforceable. Right? What are we going to do with another law if it's not enforceable? In order to understand why an act like this didn't end racism, we have to understand, again, the argument against civil rights and how they were motivated by a different type of understanding of rights. Right? So we can look back to Mississippi. Right? This was an ad that the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission placed in over 200 newspapers across the United States to argue against the Civil Rights Bill. Right? This is not something we normally think about with the Civil Rights Movement, that people would filibuster it and lobby and advertise against it. We want to pay attention to specific language, right? So the Socialist Omnibus Bill before, uh, Bill of 1963, now before the Senate, the American people are being set up for a blow that would destroy their right to determine for themselves how they would live, right? Now, this doesn't mention race anywhere, but the right to determine for themselves how they would live in Mississippi meant continue to disenfranchise African Americans and act essentially with impunity against them, right? That's the right to which they're referring. It's important that it's couched in the language of rights. It's a, it's a colorblindness, right? It's a, it's a language of rights that's meant to justify extensions of white supremacy and white racial privilege. Right? But I think it's all too easy to think it's just about Mississippi or just about the South. Right? And as I close my lecture here, I want to focus on uh, Seattle, Los Angeles, and then actually Claremont for a moment to think about how this language of rights showed up in other places and how it was used to push back against the things that the civil rights movement was lobbying for. So this is an advertisement which is supporting housing segregation. Right? So they were asking people to vote against fair housing legislation when it came up to a ballot vote. Right? And most folks in Seattle did. Right? This passed by a two to one margin, that they were going to block fair housing laws. Fair housing laws were meant to allow people to move into whatever neighborhood they could afford to move into without regards to race. That things like racial covenants, which we'll talk about in a minute, and things like mortgage redlining would no longer be in place. Seattleans didn't want that, but the language in which they opposed it is important. Right? So the Seattle Housing Ordinance dest destroys your freedom of choice, robs you of your constitutionally guaranteed private property rights. Right? What it robs you of is the ability to say, I want to live in a white neighborhood, right? and not sell my home or have my neighbor sell their home to a person of color. That is explicitly, or implicitly, the right to which they're referring. In the interest of our class, I think this one's even more provocative for its invocation of human rights. Right? So this is fully part of the history of civil rights, but it's not one that we talk about. Right? And our failure to talk about it limits our ability to understand why we have such huge discrepancies with regards to income, poverty, life chances across racial lines. I want to give some context for this and try to understand what was it that they were trying to protect. Right? What, how did these neighborhoods become segregated in the first place and how, and then how are they trying to protect them? Right? And I can just focus on two things. The first are racial covenants. Right? So these were statements written into the deeds of house. So when you sold it, you had to abide by what was written in the deed. Right? This one is from Seattle. I want to call your attention to just two things. Uh, the first is just the, the formality of it, right? So uh, city of Seattle, county of King, it goes on here to describe the property. Sort of, it's, a very, it's a legal document. It's describing which property you're buying and right, where it's located. But then at the very bottom of the page, this is the, the covenant part. This said property shall not be sold, leased, rented, or occupied except to or by persons of the Aryan race. The date here is 1946. 
a year after the end of World War II and after the defeat of Nazism in Germany. Right? This is what racial covenants looked like. Right? This is what people had on the books across the country. Right? I'm not picking on Seattle, but there happens to be a great deal of, of research that's been done on the area. Um, and here's just A through B of restrictive covenants. And I'll just call your attention to the Ballard Sunset Hill area. Right? So these took slightly different forms in different neighbors, but they're always very specific about who was allowed to buy in these, these areas. Right? So there's no part of said property hereby conveyed shall ever be used or occupied by any person of the Ethiopian, by which they mean African American, Malay, or any Asiatic race. Right? And so it shall be throughout the, the passage down of these. Okay? Now these were fully legal until 1948, right? and they were informally legal, you could say, through 1968. Right, until the Fair Housing Act was passed. Right? And they're still on the books in many cases. Right? So people buy houses, in funny cases, right? they're buying houses that technically, historically, they wouldn't have been allowed to live in. Right? So this is one of the ways in which neighborhoods became segregated, and this is one of the rights that people were voting to, to maintain. Right? The other thing we want to look at is redlining. So this is where the government gave mortgage money, created a mortgage market, to allow people to become homeowners, but put significant restrictions about who could live in which neighborhoods, and were deeply influenced by race. So this is a map of the historical data overlaid on a Google map, uh, and the site for these is on your handout, and it's a great wealth of information on California redlining. So what they did, the FHA went to local real estate professionals and asked them to rate different neighborhoods. Right? And they asked them to rate them on this grading, right? so A being green down to D being red. And not coincidentally, the neighborhoods that received green or blue ratings were almost always white neighborhoods, right? upper class, middle class, white neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that received red gradings were almost always communities of color, working class neighborhoods. Right? What this meant practically was that you could get a mortgage to live in a green or red area, but you could not get a mortgage to live in a red area. Right? It blocked mortgages, or at least it restricted the mortgages significantly just to those very small areas. It meant that, meant that African Americans and many other people of color could not get a federally financed mortgage to be able to live in these other areas. Right? I think the implications of this are probably obvious, right? It structures segregation geographically, right? So our neighborhoods didn't become segregated by chance or by choice, they became segregated by official governmental policy. Right? Again. This is what Malcolm X is pushing back against. Fair housing wasn't his issue, but he was deeply interested in the way in which the government has funneled money to white communities and away from communities of color, and why no one would talk about that. I want to show you the specific language you're using for just two neighborhoods. Uh, one is Boyle Heights. This is a neighborhood they didn't like, the appraisers did not like, they gave it a red rating. Right? And the reason they did says, this is a melting pot area that's literally honeycombed with diverse and subversive racial elements. It's seriously doubted whether there is a single block in the area which does not contain detrimental racial elements. Right? So this is one of the most um, integrated, most diverse neighborhoods in Los Angeles in the 1930s, 1940s. Right? Their particular concern here is with uh, communist infiltration of both Jews and Mexican Americans. Right? So this isn't just a black-white story. To bring it closer to home, um, here's what they had to say about Claremont. I uh, received a blue rating, or second best. Uh, first, we get a shout out here. So population is homogeneous, by which they mean white. Uh, proximity of Pomona College and Scripps College for Women, both nationally known institutions, is a distinctly favorable influence. Right? So they made note of us. But the reason why they liked it as well, deed restrictions are of good character and protect against racial hazards. Right? By which they meant those racial covenants are in place, they're going to prevent people of color from moving into this neighborhood. Therefore, it's worthy of mortgage funding. Two quotes from contemporary observers to emphasize the fact that this is not something that people have just discovered recently but have been paying attention to for a long time. Charles Abrams was an open housing advocate and a professor at Columbia University. He had this to say. So the government offering such bounty to builders and lenders could have required compliance with a non-discrimination policy. Instead, the Federal Housing Administration adopted a racial policy that could well have been culled from the Nuremberg Laws that were from Nazi Germany. From its inception, FHA set itself up as the protector of the all-white neighborhood. It sent its agents into the field to keep Negroes and other minorities from buying houses in white neighborhoods. And similarly, Clarence Mitchell of NAACP, what the Ku Klux Klan has not been able to accomplish by intimidation and violence, the present federal housing po policy has accomplished through a monumental program of segregation in all aspects of housing which receive government aid. Right? 
So again, the importance here, it's not just individual people deciding that they don't like neighbors of different colors. Right? It's government funding for exclusively white neighborhoods right? and a lack of government funding for neighborhoods of color. Right? That is the implication here. So this is fully part of the history of civil rights, but it's one that we don't like to talk about often. Right? But I think our fear to talk about it limits our understanding of the past. Right? If we don't talk about the ways in which people fought back against civil rights using a language of rights, we can't understand how conditions came to be the way, that, the way they are now. Right? To put that more directly, if we look back here, it would be intellectually dishonest to say that this is not influenced greatly by the histories of discrimination in the United States. Right? We might be aware of why the numbers might be low for blacks and Latinos, but the numbers are high for whites because they received government subsidies. Right? Decades of money being funneled to neighborhoods. Right? That is the basis for white supremacy and white privilege. Right? That is what Malcolm X is trying to argue against. Yeah. I want to close with a short clip going back to Malcolm X's uh, debate at Oxford University. Right? I ask you to pay attention just to the last thing he says. He says he's willing to work with anyone, regardless of the color of their skin. Right? I think it's important not to read that as a, as a statement that steps back from what you might think of as the more angry rhetoric in the Ballad of the Bullet. Right? I think it's a statement about his knowledge that he needed allies. Right? And if anything, I think it's a more radical statement because it's saying that the fight against racism isn't exclusively a black issue. Right? It's one that affects all of us. And I think that's a message that's as important for us now than it has it ever has been. So I'll close with this. Thank you.